2 Timothy chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at verses 8 to 14. So this is Paul getting a little bit more into his particular situation. Just before this, he was talking to Timothy and, and basically talking about Timothy's own relationship of faith and how this began with his mother, grandmother, then, of course, Paul, who was shaping Timothy as uh, Timothy's teacher and father in the faith. So now Paul's going to move a little bit closer to his own situation at the present time where he's actually in prison. And Paul's going to be talking about, well, yes, he may be suffering, but he's not ashamed uh, while he's suffering. And we're going to be getting into uh, what that really means, because usually people, uh, as uh, in English today, when we're talking about shame, uh, we're going to be talking about something a little bit different than uh, what Paul is talking about uh, here in the ancient world. So, uh, to guide us into the text and uh, Paul's strength and courage in Jesus Christ, let us begin in prayer with Psalm 28. Psalm 28. To you, O Lord, I call. My rock, be not deaf to me. Lest, if you be silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy. When I cry to you for help, when I lift up my hands toward your most holy sanctuary, not drag me off with the wicked, with the workers of evil, who speak peace with their neighbors while evil is in their hearts. Give to them according to their work and according to the, de to the evil of their deeds. Give to them according to the work of their hands. Render them their due reward. Because they do not regard the works of the Lord or the work of his hands, he will tear them down and build them up no more. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exalts and with my song I give thanks to him. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. O oh, save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. So, Psalm 28 is, of course, calling upon the Lord as our strength, our refuge, our rock, basically the foundation of our salvation, uh, according to his good and loving mercy. But we're also getting uh, into the subject of, well, Lord, why don't you visit the evil of those who are doing evil? Uh, uh, so basically, the psalmist is also talking about, well, why can't we have just punishments for those who are doing evil in this world? And this is also what we uh, actually want as those who are in the faith, is that we want uh, uh, good to be rewarded and evil to be punished. Now, of course, within the Christian understanding of things, this is going to be, mm, well, I guess you could say either complex or, or even just black and white, where we're seeing all sin is evil and all righteousness is good. But when we're actually coming to human beings, the, the, this is going to be where we get some gray, where you have human beings who are trying to do good, but they still end up doing some evil. So um, uh, for us as Christians, what we're looking for is not so much, well, who's doing good and who's doing evil, as if somebody in this world is doing absolutely one or absolutely the other. Uh, what we're going to be finding is some people have a, uh, some goodness within them, uh, and however much that happens to be in terms of their, their thoughts, words, and deeds. But they'll have some goodness, but there's also going to be sin there. So when we actually look at human beings, well, who's good and who's evil? Well, everybody since everybody has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, well, all people uh, deserve uh, death because the wages of sin is death. This is what's going on in the book of Romans as, as St. Paul is dealing with this issue uh, in, that, in that letter, where he's saying, uh, again, for all have fallen short of the glory of God. And he's saying, everybody has sinned. And then a little bit later on in chapter 6, he's saying, the wages of sin is death. So if you have come into sin, well, you're going to be punished according to that sin. You're going to be uh, given uh, evil for evil, uh, evil kind of being here the subjective understanding of this is what I don't want to happen. But since this is a punishment according to God's justice, of course, it is by definition good, but it, it, uh, we would just call it evil because it's not something that uh, that we want because there's like, who likes to be punished? And, and then you get into a whole bunch of uh, weird fantasies that some people have. But uh, even then, it's 
they're trying to get punished in a very specific way that makes them joyful. Whereas if they're to be punished according to the actual sins, like no, absolutely no one would actually want this. So uh, punishment is always given to those who are, who are deserving of punishment. And that is basically to every single last human being who has ever lived. But because of Jesus Christ, God coming in the flesh to live a perfect life on our behalf, uh, he is giving us his righteousness, uh, his honor, and his, his um, um, basically his righteousness, all the good things that he has done so that uh, before God, uh, God is not judging us according to our sins, but according to the righteousness of Christ. So before God, we are in fact sinless because Christ has forgiven our sins and taken the guilt of that sin away. So we need not be ashamed of, of um, uh, who we are in Christ because in Christ, all our shame, all the guilt, all evil has been taken away from us by Christ's cleansing blood. So, um, uh, when we're praying in Psalm 28, well, what's going on with, with um, uh, us praying that people be punished according to their sins? Well, it's like, no, yeah, we want justice to be done. We still recognize that there is forgiveness in God, but uh, Psalm 28 is getting into the, the scenarios where people are still rejecting God. They're not looking for forgiveness. So what do you do for those who reject forgiveness, who reject uh, the cleansing blood of Christ to remove them from sin, guilt, and evil? Well, they have to be judged according to what they have done. So, um, th this is, this is uh, what's going on in that psalm. So, as we get into the text of 2 Timothy chapter 1, we're going to be looking into, let's say, Paul's situation specifically, and then a little bit more generally with Christians, where we're looking to, well, not just um, uh, our own actions, because our own actions will condemn us, for again, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but we're also going to be looking into, well, who are we in Christ? So, not just who we are, but who we are in Christ specifically, and this is going to be the game changer. So, uh, Paul, uh, he speaks, and this is going to be uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 to 14, 8 to 14. Do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord, or ashamed of me, his prisoner. But join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald, an apostle, and a teacher. This is why I am suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed, because I know whom I have believed, and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. What you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching, with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, I stop there before Paul gets into some of those who do not guard the good deposit that he has given them. That is, uh, the good and gracious good news of Jesus Christ that we are forgiven our sins by his sacrifice. So, um, we stopped just short of that. I'll get into that in a future devotion where uh, we're going to be comparing uh, those who have uh, rejected the grace that is found in God, and in, in specifically in Christ, uh, with uh, Timothy, as, as Paul switches over to Timothy at the beginning of chapter 2 there. So we're going to be concentrating on verses 8 to 14 here in chapter 1. So uh, let's go through this piece by piece and see what Paul's trying to say. Uh, the passage itself, again, is coming immediately after. Paul is talking to Timothy, talking about uh, the uh, the grace that was given to Timothy by way of, of course, God's word. But this, this word, this grace of God was mediated by human beings. Like this was uh, his, his uh, mother Lois, uh, sorry, grandmother Lois, mother Eunice, and Paul himself. Now, all three of them had uh, different parts to play, but they were very much instrumental in Timothy growing up in the faith and developing the faith and actually being the person who he is at this time, him being uh, the bishop of Ephesus and uh, managing the church in Ephesus and guarding the, the, the spiritual lives of those who were there. 
So, uh, we're looking into, well, yes, uh, it's not just going to be uh, God just beaming grace into us without any mediation. It's going to be God uh, giving us grace through his word, through his sacraments uh, in Christ Jesus, given by way of his church, mediated by people in his church. So Paul, uh, in verse 8, he's, he's starting up and he's drawing a conclusion of this where he's looking at, well, yes, you have this grace, so what's going on? Now with, with me, where he's saying, do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner. Okay, what's going on with the prisoner bit? And this is going to help us situate what it means for Paul to say not be ashamed. Okay, so what does Paul mean prisoner? Well, 2 Timothy is one of the prison letters that Paul writes. There's, a, there's four letters that Paul writes while imprisoned. And you could always debate, well, which imprisonment is this because Paul is imprisoned a few different times. Um, now, with 2 Timothy, since Paul is mentioning uh, later on in the book that he actually expects to die, where you don't actually find that in, in uh, some of the other prison letters, like there's a, kind of an offhand mention of it in uh, Philippians, where Paul is still very much adamant that, um, that he would survive this. And he, he's kind of debating, well, if, should I die in the flesh now or should I remain in imprisoned. And he's saying, well, I would prefer to go see my Lord, but it's more necessary for me to stay in the flesh for the sake of the people that he's trying to minister to, namely the Philippians in the letter to the Philippians. But here with uh, the, the second letter to Timothy, Paul would be thinking of Timothy himself. So um, uh, second Timothy, since Paul is looking towards his death, his imminent demise, this is most likely his final imprisonment in Rome around 67 AD. So uh, Paul is is uh, arrested for being a Christian, and he is basically executed for this after, after a time. Uh, why is Paul arrested for being a Christian? Well, because he's one of the leaders of Christianity at this time. He's one of the apostles, and he is one of the two apostles in Rome at this time, the other one being St. Peter. And uh, since they're leading the church at this time in Rome, well, the Romans don't really like the Christians. And this is part of a smear campaign brought on by Emperor Nero. So uh, Nero at this time is trying to use Christianity as a scapegoat for some of the problems within his empire. Uh, most notably, the fire in Rome, the Great Fire of Rome, which destroyed 10 out of 14 districts of Rome in 64 AD. So uh, the people were very angry at Nero, and they were angry that uh, things were not mitigated in the fire, that, uh, that the fire did end up taking such a large part of the city. And there's even some rumors that Nero was allowing this to happen or even uh, trying to ensure that it happened. Maybe he started the fire himself because he wanted to do a few different building projects. And the people were like, well, maybe he started the fire in order to start some of these building projects. So uh, then you get into legends like uh, Nero was playing a violin while the city burned around him. Um, again, that, that's, a, that's a legend. We don't really have any contemporary saying that this actually happened. But that's the general opinion of Nero, was that he was it's kind of uh, neutral that his capital city of his empire burned down. So... Uh, Nero, in order to try and get back into the people's favor, he was trying to pick on a, a religion that was starting up that uh, was kind of off to the side enough that he could actually get away with, with uh, 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 pinning some ideologies on them and, and uh, pinning some uh, uh, evils on them, and people would go along with it. So people don't know enough about the movement as well as it's a small enough movement that not enough people would, would stand in favor of it. So he's looking at Christianity, and Christianity's uh, been a little bit contentious uh, in the empire thus far, not so, not hugely so. Uh, in part, this is because the Romans at this time were still seeing Christianity as a strain of Judaism, not, not an independent religion, whereas it actually is an independent religion because basically Judaism and Christianity worship different gods. Judaism rejects Jesus Christ as God in the flesh. Uh, you find, might find some Jews who are very much willing to recognize that he is a teacher of the faith, but they'll be rejecting that Jesus Christ is in fact the Messiah and God in the flesh. So if they're rejecting Jesus Christ as God, well then 
they're worshiping a completely different god than, than Christians are. So they are different religions, even though they're very much related in many respects because we, we use the, the same Old Testament. that They use um, uh, the Old Testament like we do. Uh, they added on uh, their own books, and this would be uh, the Mishnah and the Talmud, uh, whereas Christianity is like, well, we have the New Testament that explains the Old Testament. And they're like, well, we have the Mishnah and the Talmud, which explain the Old Testament. And we're like, no, these, these uh, basically interpret everything in, in terms of, of God's law, where you're trying to uh, work your way into heaven rather than work your way in, or live in heaven by the way of God's grace. But I digress. Anyways, so um, since, since Christianity was pinned for, for some of the evils within the Roman Empire, even though maybe you weren't responsible, um, St. Paul and St. Peter were arrested uh, uh, just because they were leaders of the Christian movement and uh, basically arrested for conspiracy against the Roman Empire and then they were executed for this. So this would most likely be when St. Paul is uh, imprisoned and writing this letter. So Paul is saying that he's not ashamed though. So why isn't Paul ashamed? Well, you have to really define what shame means in this context because for us today, shame basically means, well, for English speakers in the West, well, we're going to use shame as uh, our personal feelings. So if we feel ashamed, then we feel that we have done something wrong. So we personally feel that we are guilty of something. We personally feel that we have to atone for something, that, some, that something is wrong with us. So we personally feel this. Well, that's not so much uh, the shame that we're talking about in the ancient world, because it's not talking so much about your personal feelings, but this is more talking about your reputation. So are you shamed within the culture? And modern Western speakers can definitely uh, uh, understand this to a degree, because we still use shame in, in, in this sense as well, where uh, people who are um, guilty of things within the community or perceived as guilty of things within the community, uh, they, they still feel shame for, for uh, 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 the perception of others. So um, I think a, a good example would be um, those who are uh, entering into sexual proclivities and um, there is something called the walk of shame where, where uh, somebody it, comes together with somebody else uh, for nightly activities, and then they uh, leave this person's place uh, in the morning uh, wearing the same clothes that they are, and they're, they're thoroughly disgusted with themselves, and they feel like everybody's judging them. That, that's known as the walk of shame. So we still have uh, some of this alive and well in the vernacular today, but it's losing favor because more people are thinking, well, why should I care what other people think? And it's not the, well, I need to uh, self-govern myself so that I may do better in society. That's not what we're talking about. Usually it's, well, why should I care that other people are actually trying to condemn me for my sins? That's more what people are, are thinking. So uh, even though uh, those people who are committing the walk of shame are actually committing adultery and, and uh, that's against well, God's law, uh, people are like, well, why should this be a walk of shame? Because why should I be ashamed that I, I did something that gave me pleasure? And if I, if I am pleasured that, and that's the only thing that truly matters, everybody else is wrong for, for actually thinking that I need to act ethically. <laughs> so so uh, people are just trying to remove the shame that comes from sin by the way of just ignoring it and just uh, doubling down on their sin and saying that sin is good. So saying that evil is good. Um, what should actually occur is that uh, we use uh, society to try and guide us towards a better moral light because society is a whole, like if we, if we are personally tempted and we personally do something that is wrong, uh, that is our own internal struggle. But what is very helpful for us is uh, uh, society and especially those who are close to us in society. Uh, you could say friends, but especially family. Family can very much direct you towards proper moral living. And this is why we have a family, is that you have a governance within the household saying, well, this is what you should do, this is what you shouldn't do. And you have people who are dedicated to you, who love you, and are trying to uh, shape and direct your, 
your life, uh, not not just allowing you to do whatever you want, but actually saying, well, this is what is good for you. So hopefully you can listen to me and this is this is the way forward. So uh, shame and honor in the ancient world is very much a social thing rather than a purely um, personal and feelings-based thing that we tend to think of today. So uh, for Paul, he's, he's trying to say that, uh, yes, even though I'm a prisoner, I'm not ashamed. So being a prisoner in this day and age, well, of course, you would actually experience shame in the community because you're perceived as doing something wrong. You're in prison. And of course, people are going to think like, oh, you're a horrible, evil person who deserves to be here. And that was definitely the opinion of the Roman Empire at the time of St. Paul, because they're trying to pin uh, the destruction of Rome on the Christians, and as well as well other immoral activities. But uh, I digress. Anyways, so Paul is... Paul is trying to be publicly shamed, uh, not for doing anything immoral, because Paul is living the most moral he possibly can, according to God's word. But what he's actually experiencing is uh, shame from the people around him. They're trying to shame him for being moral, that is, following God according to God's own word. So Paul is saying, well, I, even though I'm a prisoner, I'm not ashamed of being a prisoner, because I'm being imprisoned on account of Christ. As if I have Christ, if I have the person, the, the embodiment of perfection and goodness, because God himself is perfect and good, and if he, he's incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ, well, then Christ is literally the embodiment of perfection and goodness. So if Paul is saying, well, if I have Christ, if I'm living in the gospel, if I'm living according to, to Christ's example, and why on earth should I actually be ashamed? So why am I ashamed to be a prisoner? So even though the world is shaming me and shaming me to the to the point of arresting me uh, for, for believing in Jesus Christ, well, I'm not ashamed. And uh, Paul is encouraging Timothy to have the same mind. So he's saying, uh, do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner. So Paul is himself not ashamed because he is in Christ. And he's saying to Timothy, do not be ashamed to still testify about our Lord. Do not be ashamed to present the loveliness, the, the goodness, the perfection of Christ to the world. Do not be ashamed to proclaim Christ crucified for the forgiveness of sins and life everlasting. Like this is the most precious gift that we have, and this is the most precious message, message that we have. We would actually just be ashamed if we kept this to ourselves. We'd be ashamed because as we are actually withholding goodness from the people around us. We are actually committing immoral action if we're not actively testifying to God, witnessing him to those who are around us. So Christians will be spreading the good news. They will be those who are trying to act as Christ acted in this world, trying to actually um, uh, do good and love others. And you're trying to not only just love others in terms of your physical well-being, which is what people want Christians to do. This. Like they, they want us to, to be moral and give them a whole bunch of stuff or work for them or serve them. Um, suffer for them, but they don't want to hear anything about this Jesus fellow. Well, no, the most loving thing that we can do as Christians is actually testify about Jesus Christ to these individuals because we're looking not just to life in this world, but life in the world to come. So if we're just taking care of the physical body of this person today, well, what happens to their soul tomorrow? Uh, we want to make sure that uh, they're, they're cared for not just for a very limited lifetime in this world, but for eternity. So Paul is saying, like, don't be ashamed of this, because this is exactly what is the most honorable thing to do, is, is sharing Christ. So um, the second part of verse 8 is, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. You're like, wait, what? What? <laughs> If this is so honorable and just, well, why are we suffering? Um, and Because and, Paul is very explicit about this, like, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Like, why is, why is the gospel necessarily ending in suffering? Well, again, as I was saying, uh, people, when they're actually being called out for their sins uh, and their need for forgiveness especially, well, they'll be resisting this. And uh, people who are relatively well off in society and that I myself was uh, outside the other day just kind of sitting around with a sign uh, seeing who would stop by and talk about Christ because I was doing evangelism thing and there's only a couple people who stop by and there is like a at least a couple of dozen people who had uh, walked by 
And I do know that quite a few of them actually looked over and read the sign, but uh, none of them wanted to stop by and talk at all. Uh, and uh, the people who did talk, there was one fellow who was generally concerned about something going on in his own life. And uh, we talked about that. And then there was another fellow who was himself Christian and just kind of wanted to uh, know how I was trying to present the faith and, and um, uh, the particular way that I was trying to do it with the sign. So there, there weren't many people who were actually very willing to stop and chat. And that's because a lot of the people who are here in society today, especially uh, those in, in uh, the area that I was going to, well, they were relatively well off. Like, everybody still needs Christ. Everybody still needs his forgiveness and love and salvation. And whether or not those people agreed with my sign, which said Jesus Christ rose from the dead, um, they still need to hear that so that they may know that in Christ, they too can be risen from death and brought into the glory of our Lord. So, um, <clears throat> I, I met with a rather neutral reaction the other day because no one was actively persecuting me. Maybe they're talking behind my back off in the distance or something, and uh, I didn't hear them mocking me or anything. Uh, but it was just mostly neutral from, from my perspective, from what I experienced personally. And uh, yes, this, this is what, more what comes from people who are secure. They're not looking for anything that would guide them away from their lives now because if they feel that they are content why do they why do they want anything else and uh, people who are uh, left in sin well why would they leave sin sin gives them pleasure or at least the sins that they're doing will give them some sort of immediate reward or at least they perceive it to be a reward uh, even though sin harms even in the moment even though you think it's a reward it's, it's still harming you in long term uh, even short term a lot of the time and people will engage in that. They don't really want to, to be presented with their own evils. So when you get to a Christian group in the first century, like St. Paul was, uh, and he's actively he's saying, well, you're all damned unless you're, you're in Christ. Well, people got pretty annoyed with that. And even today, if you, if you have the same message, if I change my sign, if my sign said, uh, you are damned without Christ, well, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't just get a neutral reaction. I'm pretty sure I'd get very hostile reaction. In fact, I, I even had a sign that was uh, saying something to the effect of um, Christ saves you because you can't save yourself. And then there was one, at least one person who stopped and he was actually fairly mad that I had that sign up. Now he's trying to act neutral, uh, but he was definitely not neutral because uh, that fellow, uh, he was very mad that uh, the kids would see this in the neighborhood. I'm like, yes, I want them to see this. I want them to be saved. But he's like, no, you can't have that because kids are here. And it's like, why shouldn't kids see this? Because if I actually believe what I believe, that uh, Jesus Christ saves us because we can't save for ourselves, wouldn't I want these children to be saved? Whereas he was mad because he didn't want uh, something that was different from his own worldview to, to be presented in the community. He just wanted uh, uh, everybody to develop their own position and completely ignore basically trying to search for truth and I would consider, well, religious positions like the one that I was presenting on in the sign. Christ saves you because you can't save yourself. Anyways, so when you get into, the situ into these uh, situations, eventually you're going to find that people will reject you and they're going to uh, um, cause you to suffer. Now, Paul was suffering the extremes where he's actually being persecuted unto death. Now, Christians in Western society today probably not going to be persecuted unto death, but they're going to be persecuted either to science, silence or compliance or, or, or something of the sort, where, where some Christians are too scared to share the gospel. A lot of, a lot of Christians are actually uh, changing the gospel that they might mimic the words of, of the society around them. I would say that that is very much compliance with the secular world rather than actually trying to present Christ to the secular world. So they're basically trying to make Christ in the image of the world, not, not the world in the image of Christ. So they're like, oh yeah, well, if society has these values, well, Christ definitely had to stand up for those values, whether or not Christ actually condemned them in the, in the Bible itself. And yeah, so, so when we're even perceiving there might be suffering, 
uh, for the sake of the gospel, people are shying away from this. But Paul is just very adamant, like, no, suffer for the gospel, because we expect this. And those people who are being silent or, or even being complicit with, with uh, secular ideologies that are even against scripture, um, like, they're doing so because they know that they'll suffer for the gospel. Uh, they're doing so so that they meet the, the path of least resistance and just, just stop trying to do God's work in order to look after themselves. So if they're not looking after themselves, but looking to Christ, well, they're going to be looking to the gospel itself because Christ himself is the gospel. He is God made man to suffer and die for us on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, who rose from the dead for our, our salvation and ascended into heaven. So if we're looking to Christ, who is the embodiment of the gospel, and we recognize, well, this is not just for us, this is for all people, then we are automatically, by way of faith, just going to start spreading this good news around. Why would we keep this silent? Like, this is something that we want to live out. This is something we want to speak about, because if it's important to us, we're actually going to be talking about this. Because Just think about what you find important. Uh, aren't you going to actually talk about this with somebody or try to find people who are likewise interested in these things? Yes, of course you are. You, you want to talk about these things. So if you're looking into something that's worth more than your own life, because this, this is Christ we're talking about, he's the one who, who died for the preservation of your life unto eternity. So this is more than your, just your life in this world. This is for eternal life. If, you're, if you find that this is that important, that this is, has eternal, uh, uh, infinite implications, then why wouldn't you talk about it? So, <clears throat> uh, it invites suffering, yes, of course, but this is what we want to talk about. So, verse 9, so he's saying, um, God, who has saved us and called us to holy life, uh, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. So, holy life, what, what is this? So, the holy life, of course, is the life of perfect righteousness, uh, a life that is perfectly in accord with God's laws. And what are these laws? Well, you could go through the Old Testament, and then you can go, well, why does God want us to sacrifice things and not eat certain foods? Well, those laws were given specifically to the nation of Israel uh, prior to the time of Christ's coming and Christ actually fulfilling the law of the Old Testament. We don't need to fulfill some of these Old Testament laws, but we still have the moral laws to, to um, uphold and perform. So the moral laws will be encapsulated uh, with the Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments, uh, you shall love the Lord your God, or sorry, shall have no other gods, which means that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. Uh, so we're looking at um, God as the supreme good that we're devoting ourselves to, so we have no other gods. He is God, and if we have a God, then this is what our entire life is directed towards. So you shall have no other gods. You will not misuse the name of the Lord your God, because if you're calling upon God uh, and using his name properly, giving him the proper honor, not sh trying to shame him, uh, then you're not going to be misusing his name. So you're only going to be calling upon it in honorable terms. Uh, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. So proper worship life, um, honor your father and mother. So you actually respect your parents and other people's in authority. And yes, of course, these people are sinners too, but you try to give them healthy respect, not falling into their sin, but still trying to do what is best for them. Uh, number five, it, you shall not murder. Six, shall not keep commit adultery, seven, not to steal, eight, do not bear false witness, nine and ten, don't covet. So with these ten commandments, we're looking at uh, physical actions as well as mental actions, and we're looking towards our neighbors as well as to our God. So if we're living a holy life, we're going to be uh, living to the best of our ability, uh, all to all these things, and when we find that we, to the best of our ability, can't even do these things, we are still turning to God to help guide us uh, in our lives and to also forgive us for the sins that we do. Now, so the, the holy life is defined by living according to God's words, and that I mentioned the law where we're living a, a moral life, but if we're living according to God's word, a holy life, then we're also going to be living to the word of his promise, the, the, the word of gospel. And this should actually define how we actually even approach the law. Because if we're living out the law, well, this is not for our own benefit because we're already saved. Like we're, we're in Christ. We, we have the gospel. We have his forgiveness and life and salvation. So uh, we're actually doing this law because this is good. Like by definition, good. This is what's righteous. This is what is right for us to do in our lives. So uh, when Paul is saying, 
Uh, he has called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. Like, yes, it is not by anything we have done. We are, we are sinners who have fallen short of the glory of God. We need to be forgiven, brought into God's glory and, 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 uh, and, uh, and uh, goodness. And part of this is trying to bow down to his perfection and try to uh, live out this perfection perfection as he has uh, demonstrated to us in Christ Jesus our Lord, who is living according to the commandments uh, as we find them in the Old Testament even. So the holy life is like living in the promises of Christ. So living in the law, but living as Christ lived to the law, not as ones who are who are suffering and, and hateful of the law, but those who are recognizing, ah, this is a good pathway for us to be in. This, this is the guide for us. It's not something to condemn us, but something to guide us in our life. And uh, that completely reshapes our, our relationship to the law. It's not something that is there that we must follow because it's otherwise we're going to be condemned, but it is something actually show us how to live the good and gracious life Christ has won for us. So our holy life is holy because Christ has cleansed it from sin, not because of what we're doing and how holy, uh, how moral we act. So the Christ life for us also means that uh, we're trying to be cheerful about uh, following the law, of course, but uh, cheerful about coming to our Lord, actually thirsting and hungering for his word, thirsting and hungering for the sacraments, uh, thirsting and hungering to talk with others about Christ uh, within the church, of course, and, and trying to encourage one another in Christ, but also outside the church, trying to bring more people in the church, that more people will be saved alongside us. And, and we have even greater joy as we have more people with us in heaven uh, to, to live with eternally. So, um, yeah, the holy life is one lived in Christ. So not just according to the law, but especially the gospel. Uh, this is the life that we have in the love of Christ and this love we, we act out. So, uh, and, and because of this, yeah, it is God's own purpose and grace. It is uh, what he has designed for us to do. So, so this is according to his purpose. It's also according to his grace, the, the promise of forgiveness and love in, in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, yeah. So, and uh, continuing on, this grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. So I, I talked about how, yes, of course, Christ is giving us grace, and this grace is given to us through the word and through the sacraments of God. So what is, so these things promise to us uh, forgiveness in life and salvation. Um, so yeah, word and sacraments. But what does it mean uh, before the beginning of time? Well, Christ himself is before the beginning of time. Time really began when... God made time <laughs> alongside the entirety of the universe. So uh, the universe itself uh, defined by matter, time, sorry, space, time, matter, and energy. I should, I, do it, I should do that order. Space, time, matter, and energy. Uh, if God is creating the universe, well, then all these things are actually created simultaneously with the universe because this is how the universe is defined. So if you're making the universe... The definitions of those uni of the universe are going to get made with him. So God is outside of time. This is what we mean by him being eternal. He is without time as we understand it. So um, for for Christ to be God himself, and God and Christ is of course God uh, made flesh. Um, so God, so Christ, who existed before the universe even began, well, Christ was one of the creators of the universe alongside the Father and the Holy Spirit. So the Triune God was the creator of the universe, and uh, Christ was the Word who spoke things into uh, into existence. So with Christ, uh, He is uh, before the beginning of time, uh, insofar as He is God, of course. And if He, if we're talking about grace in Christ. Uh, then this available grace to us that God wanted to generously give his people who were even yet to be created, well, this grace existed before the beginning of time, before even we began. But of course, this boggles our mind because uh, all we have known is this universe, which is also defined by time. So for us to try and understand things beyond time, it just kind of hurts our heads sometimes. So, um, we need things to be brought about in time for us to understand them. And, and this is what's going on in verse 10 here, where Paul is saying, um, uh, the grace was given us in Christ Jesus for, for the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our, 
your Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So, Paul is saying it is manifested to us. It is actually brought to our, to our vision, if you will. Um, so, when, so when Jesus Christ came into this world, where Jesus Christ, uh, the, the word that was before the beginning of, of creation, because the word was what was creating all things in the beginning, when he became flesh and, and dwelt among us, this is where he made manifest this grace to us in a very concrete way through his life and, of course, especially his death and resurrection. So with his death and resurrection, yes, he, in fact, destroyed death. So Paul doesn't explicitly mention the death and resurrection here, but if you're talking about Christ destroying death, well, where did this actually occur? Well, this occurred at the cross and the empty tomb. So through, through the event of Christ's death and resurrection, uh, we are saved. Death, death's power is destroyed because if Jesus Christ can rise up from the death, uh, rise up from the dead, and uh, and uh, proclaim that death has no meaning for those who are in Him by way of faith, then of course death actually has no meaning for us. It is going to be itself destroyed. The last enemy of God's people will be destroyed in the end. So even though uh, we may die in this world, awaiting the resurrection to come, where where the final triumph over death has has uh, been brought about at the final judgment. Uh, yet, has Christ already won this with his own death and resurrection? So, uh, even though the grace of God was from outside of time, from, from eternity, is brought into time more, most concretely through Christ's singular action at the cross and, and the tomb. Okay? So, uh, all those who were in the faith, uh, those, who were, those who were before Christ and those uh, Christ's incarnation, those who were after Christ's incarnation, uh, all of us are still saved through that singular event with Christ dying and rising again. So those who are in the Old Testament, who are believing in God, well, they're saved because they're saved in Christ's death and resurrection. They did not see this occur because they perished before that time, but because they believed in God and believed in the promises of God, and the promise of God was, of course, the Messiah, and of course, with uh, uh, the paradise to come, a return to Eden, if you will, and the promise of God was salvation from the evils of, the, of this world and uh, uh, the true paradise. Yeah. Um, then we see that, yeah, they're still hoping for Jesus Christ and his resurrection. And uh, Hebrews chapter 11 is basically all about this, where, where Hebrews chapter 11 runs through a whole bunch of the Old Testament sayings and says, well, this is what they were doing in their own lives. By faith, they were doing this. But uh, they still recognized what they were doing was still a small part of, of what, the, what was to come. So, for example, Abraham. When Abraham uh, went to the Promised Land, uh, he lived in it as one who knew that he had no permanent place there uh, because he was in part nomadic, so he was wandering around the Holy Land. Uh, but he was also recognizing that, yeah, he too would actually die in that land and he would not uh, inherit it forever. So if he was seeking a, an eternal inheritance for him, then he would need to be raised from the dead and brought into eternal life. So there's different events in, in Abraham's life that you could say, well, yeah, he actually did believe in a, a resurrection of sorts. So, um, so the Old Testament saints still saved by death and resurrection of Christ, and we who are looking back to that event, we got, we're, we're still looking at this is the death and resurrection of Christ which saves us. So, if, if uh, 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 we're trying to understand God's grace, God's grace that is uh, boundless and is part and parcel with his person, that he wants to give us his gracious disposition to, to bring us into life everlasting, because again, God is life, so it is manifest, in, or, or sorry, uh, 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 by definition in him, life is de by definition in him. So we're looking to uh, all of God's promises, well then, it's brought by way of Christ at the cross. So that's where it's manifest, but it, it has always existed, it's always he's been there, but we're brought to it directly by way of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. That, that is the one thing that we need. Okay, so Paul, yeah, and Paul is defining the, the, the gospel, basically life and immortality, so this is kind of the shorthand through it, um, destruction of death, and of course you can try and uh, flesh this out even by saying, well, this is the death of sin, uh, the, the cleansing of sin, um, 
and uh, or the adoption as as children of God, even um, having having our lives uh, renewed in in the face, so that we are no longer the sinners we once were, but we're alive in Christ, doing what is good and according to God's purpose. So there's different ways you can really describe the gospel, where, where it's a, a, a fundamental transformation of who we are. Uh, but yeah, Paul is defining here is life and immortality. So we're looking specifically at that. So if Paul's proclaiming life and immortality and people are trying to condemn him to death in a prison, well, why, why does Paul, why would Paul uh, look to human authorities and say, oh yeah, I should kowtow to you. I should bow down and, and, and look to uh, your, your demands uh, because I'm afraid to lose my life. Well, what, well Paul knew that he was going to die anyways. Uh, he didn't know exactly how he he was going to die, and there's quite a few close calls in Paul's life even before he got in prison and executed in Rome. Um, say, so like with the times he was shipwrecked, <laughs> uh, beat, nearly beaten to death and stoned. Um, like many times that he could have died, but but regardless, he knew the one who would actually raise him from death. So whatever happened to him in this in this world, like he would continue on. So if he spread the good news and he died for it, and he did. In, in Rome, in execution, then, hey, he did exactly what God commanded him to do. He spread the good word to the, to the people of the earth, and he, he ensured that the church was, was uh, uh, founded on, on the teachings of the apostles, which came from Christ himself, and that the church would continue on by these teachings. So Paul did what he needed to do, and God, God called him to himself, and, and St. Paul will be risen with us in the resurrection to come. So, uh, Paul's like, so why should Paul be ashamed of being a prisoner on death row? Because regardless of what anything human beings could do, God will work, and God will bring Paul all the uh, glory and, and honor that comes with a life of faith, a life which is cleansed from sin, death, and, well, basically the influence of the devil. So, uh, let's continue on. Verse 11. And of this gospel, I was appointed herald and apostle and a teacher. So, yeah, um, Paul, Paul is very much taking ownership of his position in this because he's actually teaching the gospel. And again, this is why he's not ashamed. <laughs> he's not ashamed. Um, because he's the one who's actually going out and spreading the good news that you don't need to be ashamed. You, you actually have uh, the greatest honor that is manageable, that is uh, being in right relation with God, uh, being in right relation with the one who by definition is good and who defines good for the entirety of existence. So Paul is very much a herald, an apostle, and a teacher. Uh, this this um, threefold designation is also found in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Um, sorry, it's chapter 2, I mean. And this comes up in verse 7. So 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7, where, where Paul is mentioning it very much in a very similar light, where, where, in, where in 1 Timothy he's saying that, uh, that God is our Savior. He wants all people to be saved. There is but one God, one meter between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself up as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time. And he's saying uh, uh, that is is what I'm trying to proclaim. This is why I was a herald, a teacher, and an apostle. So, so Paul is very much trying to spread this gospel message. And same thing here. So he's a herald, an apostle, and a teacher. So each of these things is different. So the herald, what's herald? Well, he's basically spreading the good news. So you can try and liken that to just basic evangelism. At which point you could say, well, um, yeah, everybody in the church is, is called to evangelize. Like everybody has what's called the Great Commission. And this comes up at the end of uh, Matthew. So Matthew chapter 28, uh, verse, verses 19 to 20, where Jesus says, Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all that I have taught you. So uh, we are to baptize and teach people in this world. Uh, so that they may be disciples of God, so that they may be brought into the church, the church being the body of all believers, not just a physical building or, or, or just a congregation with a certain membership list, but the church of God, the body of all believers, spanning both heaven and earth. And with this, yes, all of us are called to it. Uh, we should be spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's what I've been saying since the beginning of this devotional talk. Like everybody should be uh, brimming with the good news of Christ and trying to share this with those who are around them. Now, of course, 
uh, trying to bring it up in a helpful uh, way that people would actually receive it, it can be difficult, but we're still trying to spread this good news when and how we can. So all of us are called to be heralds to a degree. Now, St. Paul was called to be something more specific where he was trying to reach certain congregations, especially those in Gentile territory, so not Jewish, but Gentile territory, so outside the, the Jewish community. But yes, he was still called to, to spread the good news. So I'll, I'll cover teacher before apostle, even though apostle comes before teacher here. So uh, Paul is also a teacher and teachers more specialized within the Christian faith, or at least how Paul is bringing it up here. And we hear in Paul's letters, as well as in James, uh, that not everybody is called to be a teacher. Not everybody is um, able to teach. Now everybody is still called to spread the good news. And you don't need to be an incredibly good teacher to do that. Like you, all you need to do is Christ died to save you from your sins. There, that, that's one message. That's a gospel message. You can present that to anybody. Do you need to be a great grand teacher to say that? No, you don't need to be a great grand teacher to say that. Um, uh, the, the, what we're talking about with the teacher is something far more specialized where you're actually inside the church and you're trying to instruct people in the church. You're trying to get not just the basic gospel message, not just as St. Paul might say, the spiritual milk, but you're trying to move people onto more solid food. So you're trying to teach doctrine. And the uh, Book of Hebrews also, also talks about this, where, where you have some of the basics of the faith, say like uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, resurrection of the dead, um, uh, baptism even. But when you're moving on to doctrine, like this is a little bit uh, tougher for people to handle, and you need people who are uh, more, more uh, educated in the faith, who, are, who have devoted a lot more study to the faith, so that they may teach. Um, and then the author of Hebrews then starts talking about how Jesus is the fulfillment of uh, of Melchizedek in the Old Testament and how uh, Jesus is of the order of that priesthood rather than the priesthood of the Levites. And, and if I lost any of you in that, then I'm like, yeah, that, that's basically what the author of Hebrews was getting into where he's saying that, yeah, you, you have the basics of the faith, but you may not be able to, to have this solid food. So you need a teacher to bring you into, into more of the faith. So uh, a teacher is more specialized and is more of a designated position within the church. And we can even liken this uh, to a degree for the uh, preaching and teaching office of pastor. And this comes up more in 1 Timothy than 2 Timothy. So in 1 Timothy, Paul is very much trying to give Timothy instructions for how the church should act. And part of that is uh, having proper leadership within the church, uh, who should be leading, who should be a pastor, who shouldn't be a pastor. And there are qualifications for pastoral ministry in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and these also come up in Titus chapter 1. But uh, with 1 Timothy, um, Paul is talking about, well, uh, you should be living a very moral life if you're, if you're a pastor, and you should definitely be doing what is good and right for the people. And uh, yeah, this, this is a very much a called position which is not given to everybody. So. A uh, teacher could be considered in relation to that, uh, into that uh, vocation in the church, not necessarily exclusive that teaching, that position in the church, but very much tied with it. And then, Paul, and then, yeah, of course, uh, the third thing that Paul brings up is that he's an apostle. Now, this is not given to everybody in the church. In fact, it's only a very few. And these are those who were called at the very beginning of the church, the institution of the church by Christ. And Christ gave the, the 12 apostles initially, and then he also brought in St. St. Uh, Saint, uh, Paul to be the 13th apostle, Paul specifically to the Gentiles. So he's going out to the Gentiles. The, uh, the other apostles, they are going primarily to the Jews, and then uh, they also started going out to the Gentiles, but uh, Paul was the only one who was more exclusively to the Gentiles. Apostle taught the Jews, of course, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah. Um, uh, the apostles were very much designated by Christ himself, called by Christ himself, and the apostles are unique in church history, so we do not have apostles today. We do not. As much as some Christian groups want to say, oh, I'm an apostle. Uh, no, you're not. Uh, the, the apostles were those who were designated by Christ in the early church to found the church. Uh, they're the ones who wrote the New Testament, and they're the ones who have uh, taught the church how to understand the New Testament. And if you find uh, that uh, your, your 
beliefs and doctrines uh, disagree with what the apostles have taught. And you can always check this with the New Testament, which the apostles wrote. Then your church is lasting, lacking uh, apostolicity. I know that's a big word, but uh, it's, lasting, it's lacking the uh, apostolic teaching because it's removing from the apostolic teaching, the apostolic teaching encapsulated by the New Testament. Okay. So, unique position, this is what St. Paul has, and he's, and he's basically saying, you need to, to follow this. Okay, so uh, verse 12. That is why I am suffering. So he's suffering because he's promoting the gospel as a herald, teacher, and apostle. So this is why you know, I am suffering as I am, yet I am not ashamed, because I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. So, yeah, th this, is, this is what I've been saying uh, for the past 40 minutes or so, where, yeah, Paul is not ashamed of the gospel, because... Why would he be ashamed of that which gives him honor, the glory of God? Because the gospel is giving you all of Christ's blessings, the perfection, righteousness, goodness, and cleansing from sin, and all these good and gracious things. We're receiving this by way of faith because of the gospel, the gospel message being given to us. And if we have the gospel message, the words of Christ, then we're also receiving Christ himself. He is not uh, removed from his, from his gospel message. So when you, also when you reject the gospel message, you're rejecting Christ himself. So why should Paul be ashamed for guarding this? Because this is what is defining his, his honor. So even if people are trying to make him suffer for it and trying to, uh, uh, make, try to uh, apply shame to him, trying to say, oh, well, you're, you're an evil Christian because you believe in Christ. <laughs> well, guess what? This doesn't really mean anything for us because, hey, we're still doing exactly what Christ wanted us to do. This is... If people want to uh, harm us for this, well, they're trying to harm us wrongly. Uh, they're trying to harm us for doing exactly what God has appointed for us to do. And at which point, they're in danger of judgment, not us. We're the ones who are doing what is good and honorable. They are the ones who are doing what is uh, dishonest, distrustful, and basically dishonorable. Uh, so uh, if, they're, if they're attacking the gospel and the, uh, the people who are bearing the gospel and bearing the gospel rightly, then they are in danger of hellfire themselves and in danger, so just in danger of being judged according to their own evil. So, <clears throat> uh, so yeah, Paul, Paul is suffering for this, yet he is not ashamed. He is not uh, looking at this as something um, that he should be, I guess you could say concerned about. <laughs> now, of course, it's concerning if you're being uh, threatened with death, but he, he recognizes this is not something that he needs to fret over because whatever God wills, he knows that this is God's will for him and that uh, God will bring him to exactly where he needs to be in the end and to eternity. Uh, verse 13. What you have heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. So Paul is now directing this uh, away from him. So he's, so he's dealt with himself, his, his own life. And now Paul is directing this to Timothy. And since... Um, we're also reading this letter, we can also kind of see it to us because uh, we're, we're not necessarily ourselves. Timothy, we don't have the exact same charge that Timothy has received because we're not all bishops of Ephesus in the first century AD. So we're not all entrusted with the governance of the church. But we're still, we're, we're still called to follow the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. This is, this is what Paul is calling uh, Timothy too, and this is what we are called to as well, because uh, if, if we are in Christ, then we're going to be following the teaching of the apostles, we're going to be following the way of faith, uh, not going the way of the world, not, not deviating away from God, uh, because faith is what connects us to God himself. Faith has an object, the object of faith is God himself. Um, we could also say Christ Jesus, uh, even a little bit more specifically, because, well, many people could say, well, I follow God, but okay, but which God do you follow? And I brought this up earlier with the Jews and the Christians and our differences. So with the Jews, they follow God the Father alone. They don't, they reject Jesus Christ. They don't understand the Holy Spirit to be a person. So they're actually following a different God. Uh, they're following an incomplete understanding of God. So, and if they're rejecting Christ, who is himself God in the flesh, then they're rejecting God. And this is why Jesus says many times throughout his ministry, and then also uh, uh, why, why it also comes up in some of the letters in the New Testament, even beyond this with some of the apostles, is if you reject the Son, if you reject Jesus, then you're also rejecting the Father. So 
uh, if, if Jesus is himself God and you're rejecting Jesus, you're rejecting God as a whole, not just God as a part. So the Jews uh, are rejecting God. So uh, this, is, this is them going in a way that's different from faith. They're, they're not having the proper object of faith if they're following something, somebody different than Christ. Uh, for us, though, uh, if we're in the faith, then we're following Christ himself and we're going to be looking to him. And there will be people who are scared by suffering into uh, what I said before, silence or compliance. And there's different ways that you, uh, uh, different uh, things even beyond these that you could uh, find yourself being lost in. But silence and compliance where you're, where you're and withholding the good news of Jesus Christ, or you're just warping the good news of Jesus Christ to comply with what the world's trying to promote. Well, this isn't following sound teaching. This is not even following Christ. This isn't in line with the faith. You're actually just worshiping a different God, and that's namely you if you're trying to do this to prevent your own suffering. You're looking to your well-being more so than what is good and pleasing unto God. Because if you're following faith, Faith is connecting to God. You're looking to him first. But if you're trying to curve that around, curve your vision around to yourself and look at, well, what's better for me first? And you're only looking out for yourself. This is calling the question that you that you have uh, uh, faith and, and, strong, and sound faith. So you want to you wanna look to God. And, and this actually means that you're going to be moved outside of your comfort zone. Now, of course, um, people can go from... Uh, zero to 100% right away. So of course there's room to grow in the faith. So I'm, I, you don't wanna necessarily burden everybody, uh, burden the conscience of everybody if they're still struggling with sins and struggling at looking at their self and their own well-being, even beyond, even even uh, neglecting the well-being of others, spiritual well-being of others is by withholding the, the good news of Jesus Christ, the, the unadulterated good news of Jesus Christ. Um, but yeah, the, the person will still be looking to faith and, and recognizing the lack of sharing, the lack of, the lack of, uh, uh, of um, uh, devotion to God's word and following that specific word that he gave. Um, they'll recognize that as sin and they'll, they'll come and repent and be forgiven because uh, they're still looking to God in faith because you can't repent unless you're looking to God in faith. Anyways, um, it says also here, love, love in Christ Jesus. Love is, of course, uh, devotion. It's kind of an action thing. So you're actually going out and doing this in Christ Jesus. And verse 14 here, uh, the last verse uh, that we're doing for today. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. So we're not doing this alone. We're actually doing this with the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, with a good deposit, uh, the good deposit is most likely the deposit with the laying on of hands that Paul mentions earlier on in this chapter in verse 6. So this is most likely looking to also not just uh, St. Timothy's uh, spiritual life in general, but it's also looking to his charge as a minister of God's church. So he's supposed to guard that, but uh, th this, this in a more general sense is just going to be the spiritual a gift that you have received in Christ, the life everlasting in Christ's name, uh, by way of his death and resurrection. So, you're not guarding this on your own. <laughs> you can't. You, you're going to lose it if you try and do it on your own. Um, nobody can do this on their own. Uh, ev again, everybody's sinful. Everybody will still be deviating their own ways, or at least being tempted th towards the, the, the will of their sinful flesh. So everybody's going to fail at some point in time. So if, so if you're saved, it's not by virtue of you, it's by virtue of God himself. So it's not you acting, but God acting. And this is the reason why God gives you the Holy Spirit, so that the Holy Spirit can bring you into all truth. The Holy Spirit can bring you into Christ himself. The Holy Spirit is supposed to be the one who's guarding you and, and trying to shape you according to the faith, bringing you back to God's word and his sacraments where God's promises are, bringing you to the church where God is preached, where the sacraments are administered, and trying to bring you into good and faithful conversations in the church and even outside the church with other people. The Holy Spirit is going to be the one who is uh, working through God's word and and uh, working through you. So if you are thinking to yourself, oh, well, I got this. I don't need God. Well, you're you're already looking away from God. You're already removing yourself from faith because you're not trusting in him and his work in you. 
So if you're looking properly to God's work in you, you're going to be looking at the Holy Spirit who is going to be guiding you to a good and faithful lifestyle, not, uh, not uh, just um, there watching you as you do everything yourself. This is definitely a work of the Holy Spirit for you. So for us, this is also good news because we can rely on God in our lives. So we know that it isn't all up to us. We don't have to make sure that we stay out of sin, death, and hell on our own action. We can actually rely on God to do this all the, all, well, continuously throughout our lives. And well, yeah, this, this is the job of the Holy Spirit is that he is the one bringing us to Christ at all points in time, uh, even when we're uh, on, unconscious or, or maybe not uh, paying attention. The Holy Spirit is still going to be the one who is with us to, to bring us uh, to Christ, to bring us to forgiveness and life and salvation. Okay. So I'll end here and uh, let's close with prayer. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for sending to us Jesus Christ, your dear Son, who manifested the grace that you've had since before the beginning of the world. Uh, thank you, O Lord, for his death and resurrection, that we too might be saved. And we ask you, O Lord, to guide us by way of the Holy Spirit, uh, that you give us a good and very helpful measure of the Spirit, to, so that uh, we may always look to the teaching of the apostles that you have appointed for our good, that we always look to the word uh, that you have given through them, uh, that we always may receive the sacraments and, and uh, have fellowship with the, with the people in your church. We ask you that the Holy Spirit help us do all these things, that we may be encouraged in our lives of faith in this world, and that we may meet any suffering we have with, with integrity and that we may continue to spread the good news of Jesus Christ so that all may believe and be saved. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.